Every month, we hear on the news the results of Supreme Court decisions that affect everything from how we do our banking to the more thorny issues of abortion, and race relations, gay marriage. With so many rights groups lobbying the government, so many difficult decisions confronting today's politicians, it is no surprise that America is becoming a nation where moral issues are being decided in the courtroom, especially in the Supreme Court room. Now I don't mean that policies and laws are being decided in a moral way, I mean that should always be the case, people thinking what is the moral thing to do. I mean that the very basis of what is moral what is right and wrong, and how to determine what is right and wrong. This is now the subject of what is being discussed and decided by our country's Supreme Court. It seems that the state and federal Supreme Courts have become the final court of appeal not only for legislative matters, but also to uh, referee morals and, uh, morals and ethics the previous domain of the church. After all, the Bible does say that the church of the living God is the pillar and support of the truth, not a government agency or a government body. The church, that's the function of God's church, or one of them anyways. Society nowadays is taking its cue from the courts as to the acceptability of moral issues such as, as I mentioned, uh, euthanasia, abortion, gay marriage, as well as laws governing the treatment of the ill and the poor and the environment. They're, they're, they're deciding on everything. The courts are the ones who are setting the country's moral compass as if this body were the new standard for what's right or what's wrong in America. And what I'm trying to say here with this introduction is this dis direction is dangerous, that we let a group of people decide what is right and wrong, the basis of what is right and wrong. Uh, this is a dangerous uh, precedent for several reasons. First of all, judges are just human beings like you and I. Perhaps they have more knowledge of the law than we do, but they're, they're human beings. As experienced and sincere as they may be, these people are imperfect and their judgments are flawed. Solomon says, there is a way which seems right to a man, but its end is the way of death. Proverbs 14, 12. Imagine, Solomon, the wisest man, is saying, boy, don't, don't trust men to make these lofty decisions. It is foolish to put decisions about absolute right or wrong into the hands of mere humans. Another reason why this is dangerous, politics, come on, duh. We know that most judges are appointed based on their political ideology. Well, they are nowadays. In the end, many decisions have less to do with jurisprudence than politics. In his book entitled The Marble Curtain by Justice Antonio Scalia, who is a justice of the, a present and sitting justice of the Supreme Court, Scalia describes the bias of liberal judges when they threw out a law that was legally enacted and voted upon by the people of Colorado in denying special rights to homosexuals. This happened a few years back. These judges, sympathetic to the gay movement, simply used their position to strike down a law voted by the people not because it violated the Constitution, but because it violated their politics. This demonstrated that in the end, the court becomes a vehicle to accomplish an agenda set by those whose standards are not guided by right or by law, but rather by a thirst for power and control. Another reason why this is dangerous only an absolute lawgiver can give absolute laws. Again, Solomon says, many seek a ruler's favor, but justice for man comes from the Lord. 
Proverbs 20, 29 verse 26. God's laws, God's ways, God's direction are always just because He Himself is absolute. He is absolutely just, absolutely wise, absolutely unbiased. It's one thing to use the courts to interpret, to apply, to develop laws based on God's laws in our complex and ever-changing society. However, it's quite another to change His laws and substitute them for laws born of human wisdom, which the courts have begun doing, I would say, in the last 50 years or so. The most blatant expression of this is the fact that it's no longer legal to display the Ten Commandments in a courtroom. I mean, <laughs> if we need any proof, any more visible proof of the agenda. So what can Christians do? I'm not going to stand here you know, and rail about this and you know, harangue you about it. I'm just saying, this is the situation. What can we do? The Supreme Court may seem out of our orbit of influence and we may feel there is not much that we can do to affect these people. Really, can we do something? Can I do something that will somehow sway Justice Roberts, for example, his opinion? Or Kennedy, his opinion? I don't run in the same circles as they do and I don't think anyone here does either. After all, Christians are not revolutionaries, they're not anarchists, but that doesn't mean that we can't use the influence that we do have to preserve our nation and its Christian nature. A Couple of small things we can do, but important things. First of all, we can vote. You know, many say the election is over, it's too late to vote, but you have the right and the opportunity to vote for mayors. You can vote for school board elections, labor unions, so on and so forth. People who wield power are normally elected in a democracy and the privilege to vote is one way that a Christian can say, I have expressed my influence in this matter. I only get one vote and I'm not going to waste it. At least I'm expressing my vote, my opinion, my desire by voting. Voting is a way of using one of our blessings to honor God. You know, we honor God in worship, obviously. We honor God in society by doing our part to support and encourage those people who are doing God's will in the public and political area. I'm not a politician, but I can read about a politician who is supporting the ideals that I support and I want to vote for that man or that woman. Think about it. The, the, the percentage of people eligible to vote who actually voted in the recent presidential elections was about 57%. 57% of those eligible to vote in this country exercised that privilege. This means that Mr. Obama, who received 51% of the total vote cast, was elected by only 29% of the American public but he sets the agenda for 100% of the American public. And so voting is one of our most precious blessings, one that many people have died to preserve, and one that many would risk death in order to gain. How many people do you think in North Korea would be happy to have a vote as to who their mayor is, or who the governor is of their you know, of their province or their country. We cannot influence the nation for Christ unless we use the privileges that He's given us, politically in this country anyways, we use them often and we use it wisely. God removed Israel's freedom when she permitted evil men to rule her. The same could happen here if we don't use our influence while we still have it. What's something else we can do? Pretty obvious. Honor America's Christian heritage. Despite all the efforts to erase and minimize the fact in school curriculums and history books, the USA was founded by people who were God-fearing, Bible-believing, and Christian living. For example, 52 of the 55 founding fathers who worked on the Constitution were evangelical Christians. They believed that Jesus Christ was God, 52 out of the 55. 
Patrick Henry is famous for saying, give me liberty or give me death, but he also said, it cannot be emphasized too strongly or too often that this great country was founded not by religionists, but by Christians, not on religions, but on the gospel of Jesus Christ. John Quincy Adams said, the highest glory of the American Revolution was this, it connected in one indissoluble bond the principles of civil government with the principles of Christianity. John Jay, the original Chief Justice of the Supreme Court said, Providence has given to our people the choice of their rulers. It is the duty of our Christian nation, therefore, to select and prefer Christians for their rulers. Pretty direct, isn't it? George Washington said, of all the dispositions and habits which lead to political prosperity, religion and morality are indispensable supports. Benjamin Franklin said, if a sparrow cannot fall to the ground without his notice, is it probable that an, entire, an empire can rise without his aid? Abraham Lincoln talked a lot about him lately in movies and books. He says, I know that the Lord is always on the side of right, but my constant anxiety and prayer is that I and this nation should be on the Lord's side. Wouldn't you like today's president to say something like that? How encouraging that would be? I could go on with similar quotes in defense of America as a nation uniquely founded as and governed as a Christian nation without consideration that it would ever be anything else. James Madison, Thomas Jefferson, even though he was not a Christian, agreed and supported this principle. The Supreme Court also conducted its affairs with this sacred trust and understanding. As a matter of fact, it originally ruled that schools must teach Christianity and the Bible as the source of morality. That's how it started. In 1811, it ruled, whatever strikes at the root of Christianity tends manifestly to the dissolution of civil government. In other words, you attack Christianity, you're attacking the government. The two are so closely aligned. The United States was consciously founded as a Christian nation, and here's the punchline, and it was meant to continue as one. It wasn't an afterthought or a spin-off benefit. It was consciously founded to be a Christian nation. And the leaders of that time promoted the idea that it should continue to be a Christian nation. In 1962, the Supreme Court reversed 200 years of religious history and ruling and removed prayer from schools and began a course where the courts began removing the influence of religion in government and education. Even though at the time, 97% of Americans claimed that they believed in God. Since 1963 in America, we have seen a dis disproportional increase in abortions, single parent families, school violence, drug addiction, moral decline, the rise of the gay rights movement, just to name a few things. Did those things exist back in 1963? Of course they did, we're humans, there's always sin. I'm saying a disproportional increase. In other words, it was always, you know, as the population grew, it grew. But after 1963, that thing started to really grow very quickly. In 1985, <clears throat> the Supreme Court ruled that atheism was a legitimate religion equal in protection and rights to Christianity. The final insult, the final foolishness. What did Paul say? In professing to be wise, they became fools. That was the height of foolishness. There have been countless numbers of godless politicians, philosophers, teachers, artists, movie stars, writers, 
who have tried to erase the fact that this country was founded by Christians, it was governed by Christian principles, and it was meant to remain Christian until Jesus returns. They're trying to erase that history like it never existed, like there was something wrong with that, that what has been replacing that is better, and yet you judge a tree by its fruit. And I ask you, those of you who, who have lived long enough, you know, I'm old enough to remember the 60s, you know, I was aware in the 60s, and I'm telling you, we're not better now. We're not better now. The reason that America is great is because it was founded by these people on these principles. Today we have this idea that America is great because people from all over the world come here. That's incorrect. That's incorrect. As an immigrant, you're, here, you're listening to an immigrant, someone who came here and applied for citizenship, America is not great because people from all over the world come here. America is great because it was founded on these principles and it operated and continues to operate under the rule of law. And the influence of Christianity is felt at every level of society. And because of that reason, people wanted to come here. They wanted to share in the prosperity and the freedom that this foundation provided for them. We should not be ashamed to honor this heritage and make an effort to promote it in every way we can. This can include several things. We can, as I say, vote for Christian officials. Promoting Christian standards and policies and practices in every area of our community. Certainly by being faithful as Christians ourselves, providing a witness for Christ. Do you think people want to become Christians because by becoming Christians they get to go to church three times a week? Do you think that's the draw? People want to become Christians most of the times at the beginning because they see something in us that appeals to them. Whether it's our life which is open, the joy that we have, the fellowship, the love that we share, there's something about us, there's something about our group that draws them. Certainly the message of the gospel draws them as well. But conversely, the thing that pushes them away from our faith is when we do not live up to the gospel that we preach. We can also support and be involved in the church and the work of the church. You know, I say to you, hey, why don't we become the largest church in Choctaw? Oh, better than that, how, 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 how about we'll become the biggest congregation in the, in, the, in the county? Would that be a dream? Could we do that? Would the Lord empower us to do that? Well, maybe not now, according to the response. Let's use our talents and our positions and our influence to promote the Christian agenda. You know, we have a brother, one of our deacons, Don Alsop, you know, who sits on the Board of Education here. When he comes up for election, let's remember to you know, vote for him and encourage him in his, in his work. We can support Christian businesses and art and various Christian periodicals confront and, and, and reveal immorality in our schools and communities. Respect other religions, of course, but be firm in the belief and the proclamation that there is no salvation, no salvation in any other name except Jesus Christ, Acts chapter four, Verse 12, I don't have to be embarrassed about that. I don't, have to, I don't have to give an excuse. I don't have to apologize for being a Christian in America. What's up with that? If you're a Muslim, fine. You were able to come here, good. But I don't have to give up my faith. I don't have to stop proclaiming that only Jesus is Lord in the name of political correctness. 
This is the only country in the world that welcomes and encourages other religions to practice and to flourish. We go too far, however, when we write laws and we promote an agenda that destroys the religion that made this country what it is. What is wrong with us? We encourage and support religions that in the church building and out of the pulpit that we reject. And then we go ahead and write laws that undermine our religion. I wonder how foolish other countries must think we are, because we couldn't do that in their country. It is right to protect and promote the faith that gave birth to this nation and sustains it. If there is a law that is written, it should be one that pro protects and gives a special status to Christianity. That's the law we need. I mean, we have laws that protect homosexuals. We have laws that guarantee now that two men can marry each other and adopt children and now be Boy Scout leaders. We have laws that do that. But heaven help the politician that, give, that, that stands up and says, you know, we need to have a law that protects our Christian heritage. Oh my. If we want America to be Christian nation that it was meant to be, Christians need to honor this heritage and make a stand for an America that is Christian in philosophy and practice. You know, uh, um, Marty said this morning, our job is not you know, to change the world. And, you know, we, our job is to call people out of the world, of course. When we're preaching the gospel, we're not preaching the gospel that people become Americans. We're preaching the gospel that people come into the kingdom. But in the meantime, until Jesus comes, we live in America. We've got this marvelous opportunity to promote a Christian lifestyle in our nation. Why would we not do that? Why would we undermine that? Who do you think gave us that privilege? Not the devil. And then the final thing we can do to preserve the Christian nature of this country, appeal to a higher court. What we are seeing is the attempt by godless people to establish the role of man on earth, a rulership without reference to God. That's what's going on. This is nothing new. Man has always tried to usurp God's place by setting up towers or kingdoms or idols. The Bible says that this is the cycle that will lead to the final confrontation when the man of lawlessness that Antichrist will come and try not just to ignore God, but to actually take his place. Uh, Paul talks about that in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 and, and uh, following. Now I don't think that the present system is the Antichrist, but rather one more attempt in an age-old cycle to replace the Creator with the created. And this usually plunges man into darkness and destruction. Romans chapter 1 verse 21. And so Christians can preserve what was originally intended for this country by appealing to a higher court, the court where God sits on His throne as creator and ruler of the world. And through prayer in Christ we can appeal to the highest of courts to restrain ruthless leaders. Do we ever pray that? Is that prayer ever on our lips? Dear God, please restrain the evil one. Dear Lord, please mitigate the evil that foolish men are trying to bring on our country, on our cities, and in our schools. Lord, we know that the sin is always in the world, but please, Lord, can you, you know, bring it back? Tamp it down. Are we making, is it always a prayer for I want a house, I want more money, I want a car, I got a sore back, please I don't want a sore back. Is that the only prayer? Dear God, shield me from a godless system. Shield my children. God, please shield my grandchildren from a system that is manipulated by the evil one whose purpose is to destroy their faith. 
Dear God, raise up godly men and women who can lead us once again along the paths of righteousness. Not impossible, not a foolish prayer. You think God doesn't want to hear that prayer? We need to do this because in the end Jesus will come and the world will be destroyed and all will have to face the court of God's judgment. And there it's not five to four, you know, three to two, it's not one of those things. All this time, the decision will not be based on man's collective wisdom, but on God's word. In John chapter 12, verse 48, Jesus says, He who rejects me and does not receive my sayings has one who judges him. The word I spoke is what will judge him at the last day. Don't be ashamed of the scripture. Don't be ashamed or embarrassed that you answer things that are going on in the world with a, a verse of the Bible. Don't be ashamed of that. Because God Himself has said, when judgment time comes, that will be what we'll be judged by. And nobody will be laughing them, and nobody, nobody will marginalize His word when that day comes. As I said before, we, we may have little influence here, but through prayer we do have access to the highest court that exists. Now I mention these things to remind you that we can do something important and effective to preserve the Christian nature, if you wish, of this great country. You know, will, will, will America be like the church? You know, well, it isn't, it's a country. But there are a lot of Christians in America. And my appeal is let's make our influence, let's make it felt. The question is, do we? Do we vote? Do we defend our Christian heritage? Do we appeal to God on behalf of this nation? If we've simply thrown up our hands in frustration, then let's stop being discouraged and begin using the influence we do have to achieve the goal that is important, necessary, and according to God's will. That you stand up for Christ, that we stand up for what's right, this is within God's will. God blesses this type of standing up. I think God wants America to have uh, Christian ideals. As a matter of fact, I think that God wants every country to be Christianized. But in America, we've achieved it and we're in the process of losing it and it's up to us to get it back. If God could forgive the Israelites when they go into paganism and, and idolatry over and over and over again, surely, surely, he can restore us who have the Savior in our hearts. The other question that I have tonight is, how are we going to face judgment? You know, I've been talking, you know, the, I've given you the meta story, the big story, the big picture, you know, the country, the nation. You know? Sometimes it's comfortable talking about that because that's out there. But let, let's kind of zoom in and get a close up. You know? How are we going to face judgment? Will we be part of those who deny Christ or refuse the gospel or are indifferent to our faith and its exercise? Or will the Lord find us faithful? Will He find us fighting for what is right? Will He find us fearless in the face of an ungodly world? We might not win the battle in our lifetime. My question is, how will He find us? Will he find us fighting the battle at least? <laughs> Are you in it at least? <laughs> you know, that's my point. How will the court find when it will be our turn, your turn, to stand before it? You know, better to come to Jesus now as your savior in repentance and baptism or restoration then face him as your judge when you will stand in God's higher court. Better now than later. And so if you need salvation, of course. If you need restoration, of course. If you wish to identify with this congregation and join us in that work of preaching the gospel and caring for the saints, then we're going to sing a song of invocation and we encourage you to come forward to respond to this invitation because you do not know when the Supreme Judge will call his court to order.